you want to do some beatbox to start out? Or I'm high post. I'm higher than most. <laughs> I'm not from France, but I love French toast. I'm the chief of relief. Contain the wild beast. The finesse of the West. The masterpiece of the East. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that was not planned, ladies and I gentlemen. I shamed. I I would love to say I just thought of it now, but I shamed uh, uh, Alain Ducasse with that three weeks ago at an event that he was being a complete and total disappointment for. Uh, seeing your heroes just be jerks is just one of the worst things in the world. To see, you know, the emperor has no clothes, right? I mean. It's awful. I'm sure all of you Denny Hastert fans feel the same way. I mean, it's just, it was awful. And uh, I was at an event, and uh, Ducasse was less than participatory, even though he had agreed to do certain things at the event. And so as the quasi MC friend of the hosts kind of guy with the microphone, I decided the only way to get back at him would be to, to rap at him and then ask him if he was uncomfortable. <laughs> he was. It was a personal career highlight for me. Anyway, I'm sorry. I, I digress. No, this is great. I'm an, open I'm, with a good rap battle story. I think I, that's I mean, one of the best ways of solving problems. It, it's an anarchy. I'm an anarchist. I am, you know, in life, we are, we are, we are making bread. I am yeast. I mean, this is not, this is not a fucking salad. I mean, we're making bread. <laughs> in that, in that kind of sphere, let's do introductions quickly. Yeast, anarchist, <laughs> chef, blogger, television personality, James Beard Award winner. Everyone knows who this guy is, Andrew Zimmerman. He is here today to talk to us about, um, he just looked at the truck put, and when, when I asked him, by the way, I'm James Mulcahy, I'm the executive producer of The Gat Video. Um, watch us on YouTube.com slash The Gat. So we were chatting about what we wanted to talk about today, and Andrew said he wants to talk about the broken food system and how to fix it. I assume it's going to take more than a rap battle to, to fix that one. Do you know, we've tried everything else and it hasn't worked, so why not? You know, why not? Uh, <laughs> Hamburger Helper just did a hip hop album as a uh, promotional activation. I don't know, anyone here seen or heard the Hamburger Helper? One person did. I mean, it is marketing magic. Their, their sales of Hamburger Helper went up 27%. More people in the first week touched that activation than saw all of their ads aggregated in the United States over the course of a year. It was the most successful thing that General Mills has done in the marketing space in years, years and years. And like all big corporations, I'm crossing my fingers that they will do it again and, and learn from that. So I don't think it's that it may not be that far off to say maybe a rap battle isn't such a bad idea with that. You know, giant corporations, um, I love saying these kinds of things. I just realized I'm sitting in a giant corporation. Um, giant corporations get really, really risk averse, and it becomes, it becomes really tough territory for them. Um, has anybody, there's a, a TV newcomer named Anthony Bourdain. Anybody hear of him? Um, my set, my first season at Travel Channel and his second season, the network aired a uh, a special episode where I did a half hour alone of my show. Then Tony was in the second half hour of my show. Then I was in the first half hour of his show. Then he did a half hour alone to conclude his show's hour. So it was like a real crossover, but it was a, I guess what the two hour. Anyway, you get the idea, right? And it, at the time, it was the highest rated thing Travel Channel had ever done other than like one weird episode of World's Best Beaches and some fluke on the poker tour show during like a political the State of the Union speech or something. By the way, Travel Channel ratings go through the roof whenever there's like a presidential speech. Everyone wants to <laughs> go lifestyle that night. Um, and they never did it again. And I asked every single year, like, why don't we, not just with me and Tony, but why not this talent and that? I mean, like, fans love that kind of stuff. So you can never, you know, overestimate or underestimate, I'm not sure which it is, the, the power of a giant corporation to make the wrong decision. Sure. <laughs> Let's get back on top. Yeah. So kind of broad stroke first, this broken food system that you wanted to talk about today. Yep. 
my question is how broken is it and how bad is it? What point are we at right now? It, it's really broken, it's really bad, and we're at a, I think we're at a momentous time where we can slide into the abyss and be done with it. And I'm talking about good food for all as we know it. I mean, let's, just, let's just call it good, drop labels, I, uh, organic, natural, I mean all those n names have been co-opted and branded and legis mislegislated, right? You can, you can call something organic um, on a shelf, but you're allowed to spray it with every pesticide known to man before the plant flowers or blooms, which is the beginning of the fruit or vegetable growth, right? Don't know how many botanists are in the room, but this is the most ridiculous law of all time, right? I mean, all these chemicals go into our water system, they damage our fields, it hurts crop rotations. There's a lot of fallout from these kinds of issues, but there it is, you still call it organic. You can call something organic or natural on the shelves if it's, you know, what, 89 or 93% natural organic, or only a certain number of the ingredients in there, and I'm, I'm misstating it maybe by a percentage point or two, but that's not important. The idea is, is that the, the words are meaningless. We all know what a, a real food system looks like, which is a, a abundant food that's healthy and good for us, available for all. I mean, it's just it's kind of a simple concept. But I, I believe, let me just define a couple terms. I believe we're midway in a 25, 30 year social change movement sufficient to recover from the damage that we've done to our food system over the last 50, 60 years. Social change movement. It took 25, 30 years for seatbelt legislation appropriate so that now my child, when I get into the car, if I don't have my, I, I literally have to strap in before I actually get in the car. Good dad, your seatbelt, you know, but that's the coolest thing in the whole world. Um, smoking cigarettes was really cool when I was my son's age. It's not really cool now. And there's warning labels on the boxes. Stronger warning labels, by the way, in Europe than over here. I don't know how many of you buy cigarettes uh, overseas, but there's this giant white label with black writing that says, this package may kill you or will kill you. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Um, but it took 25, 30 years for us to destroy the Marlboro Man. We're in the middle of this social change movement. We can continue to pursue policies, lifestyles, and all of us turn a blind eye to the fact that eating well, as we defined it earlier, is a class issue in America. We can ignore that fact or we can do something to change it. I, I believe in, it, it used to be an embarrassment in the late 70s, early 80s when I came into the food scene as a young cook. Fresh off the boat from Europe and Asia where I'd been staging, trying to put together a college career, you know, trying to figure out where I belonged in the food system uh, as a professional. But it was, it was odd then that really good food was being served in restaurants for a lot of money. And so many people that I knew couldn't afford to eat in them. But a lot of those, it, it, and it's only gotten worse, right? Increasingly are, and I'm very pro-restaurant, by the way, I just believe that we have to have access to food in abundant supply that's healthy and we're actually, our government is pursuing policies that are the complete opposite of it. So much so that as my friend Tom Colicchio <laughs> often reminds people, if you were paranoid or enough of a cynic, you might think that the government is actually anti-social justice movement. I, I believe there's so much confusion on this subject that we've gotten away from the nuts and bolts, common sense sort of way of doing things that we were doing a hundred years ago. I mean, we've, we've centralized our, our food system and everyone realizes it's a mistake to have eight, nine, 10, 12, pick whatever stat you like, companies making 60, 70, 80, pick whichever percentage, and it's different every year, right? You, it di di differs on what magazine article you read. But the point is to concentrate so much power in the hands of so few when it comes to food is a real problem, right? Uh, we have subsidized corn in this country famously. I mean, I don't need to educate you guys on that. 
to, to the point where that food is practically free and we wonder why people on food stamps are buying so much of this stuff that is so bad for them. Why is it more expensive to buy a fresh peach in America in 2016 than to buy a fast food fried chicken sandwich? I saw an ad last night, I was watching a hockey game uh, in my hotel room, and on came an ad for Burger King. 10 nuggets now cost, it's $1.49 actually, but very good. And I was like, God, <laughs> who, what brilliant marketing person over there at Burger King's ad agency said, no, 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 don't, don't make it $1.50, make it $1.49, because you know that it costed out someone round, and the food side was like, oh shit, we can do that for $1.50 as long as we get them to buy the giant Coca-Cola. And, you know, when we're making lunch or dinner for a family that doesn't have a lot, or a person that doesn't have a lot, so unhealthy that fried, and, and by the way, that $1.49 nugget chicken is not fresh, nice chicken meat raised by Farmer Jones upstate in a chicken farm that if you close your eyes and imagine chicken farm, that's what it looks like. It does not look like that. Um, it comes from a horrible place where the stuff is slurried in famous Jamie Oliver style, right? Um, are you aware of, you, you saw the Jamie Oliver thing where he took all the bones and the crap that was half rotten and pureed it and then they uh, ammoniate it and then the machines take the ammonia out and you're left with this pink, pink slurry of chicken bone and fat and skin that most nuggets are made from? Yes? No? I'm getting naughty mm. next. Um, so, in a world, in a world, I mean, this is America in 2016. I love my country so much. I am the biggest patriot that I know. I mean, I'm really overboard. On, I'm like Abraham Lincoln, Washington, Cherry Tree, you know, Sons of Liberty. Love this country. How is it in the greatest country in the history of the world, in the greatest civilization, at a point in time where we have the most romantic and loving relationship with food, where we know the most, can produce the most, and have the technical ability to feed the most, are 20% of Americans food insecure. I, I just don't get it. It's, not, it's no longer an embarrassment. To me, that's criminal. It's criminal. I don't understand why it's illegal for someone to sell loose joints. Uh, those are marijuana cigarettes. <laughs> In grade schools. But it's okay to give them soft drinks that have 40 grams of sugar in them. Oh wait, sorry, soft drinks only have 28 to 30. It's the mock mango smoothies from Adwala that have 40 to 60 grams of sugar in them. So if a kid drinks one of those, I mean, I don't know about how many of you are parents, but you know, at the time that my eight-year-old was drinking them was like, I mean, peel him off the ceiling, he's done. I mean, it's a three-hour shutdown at that point. <laughs> I, I cannot understand for the life of me how in this country we let that kind of thing go on. And we could go on and on and on. I mean, you know, uh, diabetes, you know, is up, you know, type 2 diabetes is, is up like crazy. Our waistlines are growing. Um, and the sensible solutions are out there for people, but somehow they're either not cool enough or our legislators don't take them seriously. There's a giant problem. So we're at this shape-shifting point where we can continue to ignore the problem and things will get worse, irrevocably worse, in terms of we're losing species, right? Giant bluefin tuna stocks, they have now, I, I just read it two or three days ago, and for years we've been hearing giant bluefin tuna disappearing, giant bluefin tuna disappearing, and everyone was saying, well, slow down a second. Underwater schools of fish, as we, and everyone, fish experts, were saying, well, not pelagic fish, pelagic fish are fairly reliable, and they're like, oh, cod stocks and other things, they, they come and go, and halibut has off years, and it comes and goes, and tuna experts were saying, not pelagic fish, not pelagic fish. And sure enough, they now have determined that 90, you know, tuna is down 98% over the last 50 years and almost been fished into extinction. On the flip side, fruits, we are talking earlier, bananas. I don't know how many of you read the banana.com uh, blog. <laughs> One of my favorites. Uh, the, uh, I used to tell this story because I, I was aware of the issue in the 60s, but in the 50s, there was a great for 100 years, 1850 to 1950, there was an incredible banana being shipped all over the world. 
out of South America. Um, there was a blight, and that species was killed. And they found a blight-resistant uh, cultivar of banana called the Cavendish. And that's the banana that we've eaten, I believe, since 1962. 99% of the bananas in the world that are eaten, uh, in, sorry, in the West, are Cavendish bananas. Well, now there's a Cavendish banana blight, one that's so bad that the Global Banana Conference was moved from its location in Costa Rica this year to Miami because they didn't want people you know, being exposed to bad bananas or some people trying to smuggle other species. You know, like a lot, apparently a lot of shenanigans go on to banana conferences. Uh, no jokes, please. Uh, and, and they moved it to Miami and, and they are, they're basically saying, we are going to have a new banana. And the new bananas that they're looking at, the two or three that they can cultivate easily and swap in to these farmers and get the numbers going. In other words, the trees will grow fast enough to produce fruit and we, We'll, we won't skip years where we just don't have enough bananas, um, are ones that are, wait for it, easier to transport, thicker skin, not as tasty or as good for you, by the way, but they'll look really nice and we can sell them. It's, it's like we're repeating the, the hor horrific nature of the red delicious apple in our American, you know, addiction to have something that looks pretty and is at the right price, and we're going to ignore everything else, which is what we do famously with meat. In our meat, you know, the, the problem with beef in America is that, you know, prices have stayed steady, uh, pegged to inflation since the 1950s, and the, the lobbies are very, very strong. So the, the eye, the size of the muscle, has stayed the same in the supermarket in individual wrap portions for 45 years. And the color has stayed the same for 45 years because everyone knows that that's how most Americans look at it. I want to see the size of that muscle and I want to see it be a certain color, right? When the fact of the matter is, is that everyone will tell you and a, another, I mean, Michael Pollan has been touted, a lot of people have been talking about it for 20 years, eat less meat, right? More beans and legumes, fresh fruits, you know, a meat the size of a hockey puck, only one or two meals a day, I mean, you know, on and on and on. Brand new study just came out a couple of days ago. I saved all these things. I brought my uh, my uh, iPad because I was going to cite. I was going to do a lot of citing, which I've always wanted to speak somewhere where I had to do a lot of citing. Uh, but uh, you, you can look it up. You can Google it. <laughs> That's what I did. Um, the A brand new study just came out three days ago uh, over in Europe that confirmed, in fact, that eating less meat in every possible way it was measured is better for you. Not eat no meat, just weigh less meat, right? So America, we're the, we are addicted to 14 ounces, you know, a giant steak or a half chicken on a plate, big hunk of broccoli or cauliflower, baked potato, salad bar. I mean, that's, right, that's what we want our plates to look like, and that is the least healthy way. We all think breakfast should look like Denny's. Two pancakes, two eggs, bacon, sausage, a cup of, you know, where it's much better to have a French cooker's breakfast, a cup of espresso and a cigarette. I mean, it's actually better for you than the, the American classic breakfast. So, I mean, we, we are at this place in time where we've done so much, so much damage. I mean, we could go on and on for hours talking about, you know, chicken farms and feedlots and, you know, water supply and all this kind of stuff. We need to have a major comprehensive national food policy and one agency that is in charge of uh, the legislation, that, of supporting the legislation that comes out of the creation of that department. And that's really the nuts and bolts solution of it. It's, I mean, you can peck away at this thing, but I think our big problem over the years has been we, we do galas uh, and to raise money for food shelves, but it doesn't make a dent in feeding the populations that need the food. I'm on the board of several agencies that do, I'm on the board of Taste of the NFL. I mean, we raise millions of dollars every year. We support these food shelves in all the NFL cities. And we, every year when I talk to the people who run the food shelves, we cannot keep up with the number of people who need. And the people who are there are not homeless people who 
uh, somehow have found themselves without a refrigerator. We're talking about, in some cases, families where both parents work. It used to be the classic, you know, one income families couldn't support. Now we're finding, even because of the minimum wage issue and stuff like that, that some dual income families can't afford to feed themselves 21 meals a, a week for their family and have the car they need to drive, a safe home. I mean, this is, this is America in 2016. Something is radically, radically wrong. We are throwing so much love and attention at the wrong places. It's, you know, the government is slashing. I think the last farm bill, they were cutting nine or ten billion dollars, that's with a B, out of the food stamp program, something that has been one of the few things that's been working for a long time, right? And we finally got, you know, SNAP and other types of uh, food assistance programs to have their chits accepted at farmers markets and places like that. So it can actually be somewhat of a sustainable system. And we can't raise that kind of money doing galas and telethons and donations and Salvation Army type stuff. I mean, it's just, we can't keep up with it. We need, you know, FDA and USDA are, they overlap on some things, they, they, they don't meet on others, and there's a huge place in the middle that we're just not taking care of people and they're falling through to the there is no safety net. Um, we need to radically change how we look at food, and I believe, as do a bunch of others, that the solution has to be political and legislative, because otherwise, and that's, I think, where all the new thinking of some national leaders on this, thought leaders on this issue, is that it has to be political. Tom Colicchio and his uh, uh, FPA have been, you know, foodpolicyaction.org have started four or five years ago, go, created themselves and started going down that road, and I do believe that is the only solution that's going to work. How far away do you think we are from kind of an overarching solution like that? I mean, you're describing global problems as well, so mm -hmm. it really doesn't just rest with our country. And then is the local governments and local progressive places maybe filling this void a little bit with these policies? Well, the problem is, is that none of the policies match and they don't queue up dollar-wise in terms of matching funds from the government, which is why we need a national, you know, a, a, a United States government, a federal agency to man this thing. Once we get a federal agency online that's actually doing the job that government is there for, I am uh, complete transparency. I am a left-wing, 1960s Lindsay liberal. Right? He was mayor of this city for eight years when I was born. Um, that was the environment I grew up in. I, I'm not on Karl Marx's left knee, but I'm on his right knee. I mean, I'm, I'm almost all the way at the end of the, I'm not quite a social utopian, but I, ah, there are things about it. So I will confess I'm at the far end of the spectrum, just so you, you know where I'm coming from. However, I really do believe that we are at the time and place where the problems have been so easily isolated that while as left-leaning as I am, I don't believe in bigger government because bigger government tends to cloud the issues. I, I believe in the power of business. I mean, I teach entrepreneurship at Babson College. I mean, I believe that business, especially small business, can save the food world. And I've dedicated the last four or five years of my life towards trying to enable and teach and help people grow those small food companies all across the country for that reason. Because I've seen so many of them fail and I believe that you got to pick a place to do it. And if I believe in decentralizing our food system, I'd be working positively towards a change, an end, a, a, a means to do that. But, you know, at its very core, our founding fathers, I do believe, uh, felt that the one place that government had a major role was in protecting the safety and security of its people. And I believe that includes health and wellness. And I believe it has risen to that level. And we have two antique departments, the FDA and USDA, that, that should, be, they should be scrapped. A new one should be built. We should have a food department. There should be a national food policy. I, I find it curious that no one has even asked. I've not heard, and I've been listening really closely, no one has asked any candidate if they what their position is on national school lunch program. I mean, that's pretty important. Last time I checked, 
everybody in this room was a kid once who ate at school. Some private, some public, but everyone ate at school. I mean, shouldn't we have some kind of way to make sure that our children are eating the right way, at the very least? Everywhere that the public dollar intersects with food, we have a problem. Jails and institutions, the way we feed and care for our elderly in uh, assisted living uh, facilities that uh, receive government money for food. Um, those populations are the worst served by food. And, and I'll tell you something that I, I think we all have a little bit of a trouble with. I am part of the problem because I globe trot around the world and have for the last 11 years showing yet, yes, I mean, I, I show both sides of the coin. I'm, I'm tribal. I'm in very poor neighborhoods. I'm in slums, the you know, largest slums in the world I've done entire programs from. But I've also done the million dollar Victorian mansion in Mississippi and the fabulous big spread and it looks like it should be out of the centerfold of garden and gun and it's a lifestyle that only a handful of people can access. And I feel, I feel a little bit of guilt about that because I'm selling something that nobody can participate in. And I think we have to start a lot. We, we're, we're so badly misaligned that, that where it starts is with, a, with some kind of national policy. What about, and then it can go down to state and local because there are certain things that state and local governments are ideally suited to monitor, put in place. I mean, it, the needs are different in Alaska than they are in Florida. I'm the first one to tell you. But I mean, the, the idea that we have thousands of tons of meat rotting away in freezers, whether it's alligator meat in Florida or uh, bison meat in the southwest, and we can't get that healthy protein into the hands of people that need it the most. I mean, you know, we talked about, I talked about the magazine article. And you hear people all the time talk, you probably recognize this phrase, the warm hug that food gives. It does. It makes some people feel really good. And if one of you came to my house and I cooked a really wonderful home cooked meal for eight of you and we sat on the deck outside and watched the sun uh, set and the moon rise, it would be an idyllic experience and you'd get that warm hug that food gives because the food would be really good and a really nice setting. But the people who need that aren't you guys. The people who need that warm hug are our seniors in those state-run facilities, people in jails and institutions, kids in school, right? I mean, you follow me? We're giving that warm hug to the wrong population. So in that um, kind of Spirit, is there something that we can do as consumers, you know, as more average consumers, not these needy populations, make better choices that will inform the food system and the consumer dollar talks as well, in addition to policy. Does that help or is it too late for that sort of intervention? And what are some of the better choices we can make in our everyday decision making? You hit the nail on the head. Take the question mark out of that and make it a statement and, and that is your answer. We can, I firmly believe it's it's why I make the show I make. Um, and I've said in a lot of interviews, you can change the food world one plate at a time. You make it every time you go to your market, you make it every time you sit down with friends to eat. I am a lotus eater. You know, I am a hedonist. I am still going to drink. I, I understand that sugary sweet sodas are bad. And I still, once a week, I love my root beer. Sometimes I'll have two. I love root beer. Root beer is like, ah, it's the elixir of the gods. Um, but I know it's not good for me, so I have to limit my intake of root beer. And I talk about these issues with my friends. And I actually, I'm looking out at a sea of, well, there's one or two of you that are younger than me. Um, but I'm looking out at a sea of faces that I believe, because I'm an optimist, uh, super optimist, I believe that you people actually care more about this issue at this time in your lives than my generation did at that time in our lives. I think that you guys have been preached at and TV'd at and magazine articled at and online blogged at about these issues to know that there is something wrong with this. Um, my parents never wanted to have me volunteer somewhere to do something, but my wife and I want our kid to volunteer and do things and help other people. Um, I think the social climate is different in America in 2016 in a good way. And I think that, I mean, if you just look at it, and I, I hate these terms, so I don't want you to think that I support the use of them. 
Uh, things like farm to table, it's just a god awful term. Uh, whoever names the generations, who's in charge of that? Who named millennials millennials? I don't get it. However, everybody has, you know, signposted the five or six uh, attributes that millennials represent. And my favorite one is transparency. And, you know, I've tested and measured this with millennial friends of mine and millennials who work for me at, at my office in Minnesota. And they are much different feeling. They have a much different feeling about this issue than I ever had. Um, so I do believe that voting with our pocketbooks, practicing what we preach, spreading the gospel, but most importantly, becoming politically motivated to help change this. And, and I think that's something that our country has done a really bad job of. Um, famously, in a lot of countries that are stable democracies, semi-stable democracies now, um, the first year that they held elections, turnout was massive. You know, I, and I'm not trying to hold up Iraqi politics as a, as, a, as a model for the American system, but I remember watching TV when, uh, after the, the first Gulf War, and like one of the few like beautiful stories that came out of that incredible shithole of an event was seeing so many like real uh, uh, Iraqi citizens. I mean, moms, dad, and people. I mean, I've spent time in Iraq. I spent time in Syria. The most beautiful and nicest, kindest people in the world. My Syria show is must see TV for anyone who wants to witness what the kindest society in the world looked like just a few short years ago. Albeit ruled by the wrong people, the, the, the folks who actually live in that country, the most gracious and kind I've ever met. Incredible show we shot there. But seeing the Iraqis with the, with the purple finger, I have a, I have a Iraqi uh, 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 ballot sheet uh, hanging in my living room as a reminder to me, because I, I put it in the living room and not in my office because I wanted visitors to my home when they're sitting, they have to look at that and they have to look at a stuffed buffalo on the wall that I shot. And I, it's purposeful, so I can talk to people about these issues that are very important to me. And you know, they had like, I don't know, 90% turnout. I mean, they couldn't keep them away from the polls. Here in our country, you know, we have political entities, politicians, local uh, and state governments that are actually trying to prevent certain population groups from voting, or at the very least make it harder for them to vote in a country that was founded on the premise that everyone should have a right to vote. I mean, it was over a tax issue, but I mean, taxation without representation, right? I mean, you know, you get a right to vote in America, and our turnout is notoriously low election after election. I believe that if we push our, our legislators, and it's why I like Tom's uh, the Colicchio's group, they do that legislator scorecard, and it's all based on food issues. If we push our food leaders, or if we push our political leaders onto what I, a lot of us call kitchen table issues, and we insist on holding their feet to the fire, we will do more to help change our country. You know, I am not the one who coined this phrase, um, and I'm not even sure Tom did. Uh, I'm sure it was smarter people than us. But the moment we actually have a food policy and one legislator loses their job because we don't like the way they dealt with it, you will see a giant sea change, and I believe that will happen within the next 10 or 12 years. I think we have to reformulate our cabinet. I think there has to be an, a a national food policy, and that needs to be enforced by a food department, not an FDA or USDA. And I really believe that we can start at the local level to do that too, get our local politicians talking about food first. I mean, local congressmen, city council members, you know, uh, local, when I say local legislators, I mean at the state level, you know, they need to be invested. Farms, that, those are jobs programs, you know, and I look at companies. Google's a different kind of company, but I look at the fast growing food company in the world right now is a company called Hampton Creek, run by my friend Josh Tetrick out of San Francisco, California. His first product was a vegan egg. And uh, his, but he didn't sell it. His second product was mayonnaise made with the vegan egg, right? So it emulsified with oil and stuff like that, and it tasted fantastic. It's a great tasting mayonnaise. Now, what he used to create that egg were plant uh, products, uh, proteins and, and 
other chemicals extracted from certain uh, plants were used to make a fluid that would replicate the 22 actions that an egg has in the kitchen, right? Crazy. That raised millions and tens of millions of dollars, put the smartest people in a room, and three years later they came out with this amazing stuff. They now have like 43 products launching by August. They're the fastest growing company in the year, of, in food company in the world. They just went over a billion dollars in sales. I mean, this is this epic kind of wonderful success story. I've known Josh for a long time, and one of the things that that I I take a little bit of credit for is that through our our talks and friendship and telling the story of Hampton Creek as many times as I have, and I pro, first one to profile them on television, it occurred to me because I've been to all of these horrifically poor countries around the world. Let's just pick one, call it Haiti. If he is using sweet potato vines and certain types of peas that grow like wildfire in a tropical environment, isn't that fantastic that we could have a uh, farms in third and fourth world countries in the equatorial band around our country growing vegetables that actually could get a fair market price the way we started to with coffee and chocolate and vanilla beans, right? And it, wouldn't it be wonderful if those applications could be used towards healthifying our food system? It would be a diplomatic victory. It would be a jobs bill. It would be an economic development. Instead of just throwing millions and millions of dollars at Haiti and letting their government make decisions about what to do with it, if we did it through the entrepreneurial business system of putting food companies in there that were doing that, what a fantastic, fantastic thing. Those kind of things I really support, and I believe searching out those products and and buying them. Hellman's famously sued Hampton Creek because they called their first product just mayo. And Hellman said, oh, no, 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 that's not mayonnaise. They can't call themselves mayo. And Josh was like, we're not calling ourselves mayonnaise. We're calling ourselves mayo. And he did it purposely so that he could eventually get this fight started. And the Hellman's people, along with a, uh, I believe it was the FDA, um, again, you can Google it, it's a great story. I, but um, they were taught, and someone made a joke about, well, we could kill them, that would solve the problem. And they, you know, my name is all over the thing because I was sort of pimping them out a lot in the media and stuff like that. And um, I was just so proud of that because when those people are worried about you and angry and making jokes about offing the head of this company, you know you're on the right track. I mean, that's how you know you're on the right track when you have enemies. You know, my my entertainment lawyer said to me, I'll know when I'm really successful when someone sues me. I think there's some truth to that. Um, so, you know, these are the things with it, you know, when you start to scare people like that, you're breaking the old system. And I think Josh's uh, uh, corporate motto, it's ad hoc and kind of behind the scenes, it's not the official mission statement. But Josh's favorite quote is, if we could start blank over from scratch, how would we do it? And I think with certain parts of our food system, we've tried to correct it so many times instead of saying, you know something, bulldoze it. Let's start over. This is America 2016. We have the smartest people in the world in this country. Let's, re let's actually reconstruct it. It doesn't take that long. I'm, I don't know about you guys. I'm horrified. I mean, horrified when I turn on my laptop in the morning and my news starts just auto-populating in my e-box. And I read, a, and I, I hope I get this right, and my apologies to Subway if I get it wrong, but I think it was Subway. Subway came out and said, we have a big announcement. We are going to use only cage-free eggs in our stores. And I was like, oh my god, that's fantastic. And then I kept reading down the article and said, and we promise to do this by 2025. <laughs> you know, I mean, this is, this is, this is nuts. Now, I, I've been in the food business a long time. I get it. Subway's a big company. And so if they're going to have a national, uh, global policy with sandwiches all over the world, the supply lines and distributors. So I get it if it would take two years or a year and a half. They really want to make sure it's right. 
But there are so many suppliers out there with cage-free eggs, and Subway, as big a company as it is, ain't using that many eggs. They, they're, they, their egg salad isn't their biggest seller. Uh, but for them to come out and say it's going to take them nine years to commit to this, to me says everything that's wrong about our broken food system today. They came out with it to make a statement because they know people aren't going to read more than three lines below the thing. And it, the, the, the headline everywhere is Subway commits to cage-free eggs. And so everyone's like, oh, Subway, that's fantastic. Campbell's came out and said, we are not going to, we believe in truth and labeling. and We support the uh, transparency of having uh, no GMOs in our soups, blah, 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 blah. What they didn't say was, what they, I think they should have said, like, we're going to make our soups from scratch. We're going to put natural products in our soup, and we're going to we're going to use the right thing. We all know we're looking at vegetable soups. Going to be just vegetables and soup cooked by real people in a can. Canned food's great. Hamburger helper's great. Those things you got to be able to feed people, right? We got billions of hungry people in this world, losing arable land, so many different problems. We have to have solutions for everyone. You know, not everyone is going to get to eat at Eleven Madison Park. And you can't tell them to, to build a billion seat restaurant. Wish that was the case. But we have to start applying common sense stuff. We have to start doing it politically. And we have to start calling people on their bullshit. I mean, it really, it really has gotten to that point. And I think, luckily, if you ask me, I think it's going to happen over the next 10, 12 years. I think we're going to see enough change. It, it may take 15 to get there. But I think we're going to, I think we're going to do it. So, Chef, I definitely want to leave a lot of time for questions like we discussed. Yes. But also, you know, part of your job is to evangelize these better yes. ways. And you mentioned something to me about a blood oath that you took with some of your chef friends. I can't talk about it. You can't that. talk about it. I want to hear about the blood oath. I, I absolutely, I, if I told you that story, number one, it's the type of thing with so many famous people involved and that kind of like who killed John Kennedy kind of thing. Where's Jimmy Hoffa buried? I don't. I'll tell you. The uh, so I am uh, I'm at an after 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 party at the Miami uh, Food and Wine Festival, South Beach Food and Wine Festival, and you know everybody thinks that there's some kind of door that you know the forty or fifty food people like me all walk through, and we're alone in this fantastic place, and it's just vats of caviar, and you know. Satyrs are wandering around, and you know, the, you know, Dom Perignon Rosé '62 is flowing from machines previously used at the Kimmelman Bat Mitzvah for chocolate uh, dipping, um, and that is true. Um, but this was a larger party; there were some normies there. Uh, no, horrible joke. Um, but it's actually very rare for a lot of us, the right people, to be in the room at the same time, and. There were 10 or 12 of us gathered around a little circle with a lot of other people trying to get in on the conversation. And myself and Jose Andres and Calicchio and Bobby Flay and uh, uh, Jean-Georges Von Gerichten and I'm blanking on some of those, you know, people like that. And we're all staying around and the game that we were actually playing was who was cooking at that restaurant in the 80s, because the 80s was a decade. I completely forget the 80s. I'm a recovering alcoholic and heroin addict, and that, that was the decade. I didn't sober up until January of 92. So I can't tell you a thing about the 80s. When I married my wife, she laughed because I'd never seen an episode of Friends. <laughs> it was true. I just missed the whole decade. But I was cooking a lot in New York, and we were all trying to figure out who, because we were all young line cooks coming up, and you know, we remembered, like, this guy was amazing. Whatever happened to him? He was such a better cook than all of us. And it's, it's odd how so many of us were working in the same restaurants at the time together or, or followed each other when one person left, because the world of line cooks in New York back then was you know, fairly finite. And it's amazing that so many of us now in our 50s are kind of like elder statesmen in a much more popular food universe. And at one point, someone said, oh, are you going to contribute to such and such gala or whatever? And um, Tom, you know, got, Calicchio, got on his soapbox again. And it, it, was, it was so motivating and so inspiring to hear somebody, I mean, it's one thing to say it, you know, for me to say it to you guys. 
But when I grab my colleagues, I mean my real peers and colleagues by the lapels, the ones who aren't playing the game the right way, and convince them that fewer galas, fewer fundraisers, fewer of everything, dedicate all your resources to putting a million people on the mall in Washington, D.C., insisting that our government right, change its way of doing things and insisting on a national food policy, national food policy and a federal agency that would supervise it. I mean, you know, those are the kind of things that are really, really meaningful. And that perhaps this was the year for all of us to kind of collectively take a step back from, you know, pissing in the wind. You know, I, I'm, I'm still donating as much as I can to my local food shelf because I can't not do that. But on the bigger, grander scheme of things, taking some of the energy that I've been doing that hasn't been making a change, throws, helps throw a nice party, and maybe focusing it on a couple days on my schedule that I go to Capitol Hill and I work hard on something. And it made sense to me, because uh, two years ago, I got a phone call from the one organization, and they asked me to help, they wanted me to tell stories about Africa and help electrify Africa. Because if you want to make Africa safe and secure, how about giving them electricity? Let's stop throwing money over there. Let's stop supporting tin pot dictators. Let's stop supporting oligarchs. Let's stop sending bags of rice out of cargo planes. Let's just give them electricity. So the food that they grow and make themselves can be stored. Let's give them electricity so that you know when we give them medicines that are perishable, they can have them in refrigerators that, that work. If you put electricity in Namibia, it would become one of the most the leading exporters in the world of fish and shellfish. The best seafood in the world comes from the skeleton coast as it wraps around the western side of the Horn of Africa. The best in the world comes from there. Not Spain, not New England, not Australia, Namibia, right? But they don't have electricity, so they can't process the fish and seafood. I digress. If we, if we can put together, right, the attention in the right way, as we did with the Electrify Africa campaign, and if the food people took a page out of the so social justice playbook that one has, solely focusing on legislating issues one after another after another, I think we would have more success. So it really resonated with me, and we all sort of took a blood oath that that night that that was going to be. Our focus, and I'm I'm super super proud of that because I've I've seen it work with one. So, anyway, I I, I said I said to James over over lunch. I said I talk a lot, so I really really want to do is have a conversation. So he said, well, we'll we'll have ten minutes for Q and A. I said, let's leave twenty five minutes for Q and A. I don't think I even let you ask a question. <laughs> I got four in. I, got, I got, think I got four. Oh, my it's good. God. But that said, I think it's time for questions. We have 10 minutes. Let's do questions. Let's do questions. Who has a question? Do we have a microphone? Oh, the mic is over here. here. If you shout it out, I will repeat the question so Let's the audience at home yeah. can hear it. Okay. So uh, I remember Oprah famously said, eat less meat or don't eat meat and they sued her. And uh, that worried me because I think if someone does try to change things, the food lobby is very powerful. How do you believe that that will get over? Well, I think the food lobby has gotten smart enough, as they've seen their market share uh, fall apart, um, that the way to do it is not to threaten and bully. The people who are calling for not eating as much meat uh, today are not being sued. We know that a healthy diet, I mean, confirmed, you know, eat less meat. You will live longer, you will be disease free, I mean, or, you will have less diseases, you will live long. I mean, it's, it is staggering the data in this brand new study that just got released two days ago. Um, you know, no one has sued me, and I've been saying it for a long time, a year and a half, you know? But it really, I mean, not because I'm a meat eater, but just because, you know, you want to make sure, the last thing I want to do is one of those people that one year says, well, a flip-flopper, and then no one believes anything you say. So you like to be kind of sure of your issues when you're going to, when you're a person like me that actually has a platform, and I take a lot of responsibility. I wanted to have a platform so I could do something, you know. With this, my my show, some people think it's fat white guy goes around world eats bugs. 
<laughs> I, I'm serious. That's how it's been described, not by me, by other people. But there's a lot of people, and I'm sure this being a very smart crowd, gets that it's it's not about that at all. It's about preaching patience, tolerance, and understanding with other parts of the world. We're all part of a global community. And let's tell uniting stories around food rather than divisive ones about who we like to have sex with, what music do we listen to, what kind of God do we believe in, what language do we speak, what color is our skin, all that shit's irrelevant. I mean, this is 2016, it's a very, very flat world. Let's talk about the things that unite us, not the things that divide us. And we're talking about solutions from another place. You know, I just came back, I mean, I could list 100 countries right now, or 100 cities, places I've been in, where they eat the diet that we would best emulate. I just came back from Okinawa, some of the happiest and disease-free and longest living people in the world live in Okinawa. I was cooking with five grandmas only to find out there were five great grandmas and all in their late 80s. And I, I, I shit you not, if you go to my Instagram and you, you, you only have to go back like three, four weeks, there I am with these five ladies in this kitchen. Not a single one of them looks over the age of 65. They're all in their late 80s. And they're cooking away and fast and conversational. The rest of us now, I just buried my dad at age 87, 88. Had a long, great life. It's fantastic. You know, happy and wanted to go. But his condition at the end was nothing like these women. And the difference there is they really believe in uh, Yakuzen, the the uh, the healthy uh, attributes of a lot of bitter vegetables and greens that they incorporate in their diet. They all still sleep on futons and they sit on the ground to eat. So they're constantly up and down, up and down, up and down. So they're flexible, right? They all exercise. They all garden because everyone, it's, it's almost part of the Shinto belief in that part of Japan that everyone, even people window gardening, but they do it every day so they nurture something. And they're respected in their culture. Old people in our culture are no longer cool, right? I mean, we're, we're even going to put Brad Pitt and Angelina away in a home somewhere at some point, right? Let's not look at them. Oh, they're, they're old people. They're in a wheelchair. They've got diseases. I don't want to look at that. That could be me someday. Out of sight, out of mind, out of sight, out of mind. I mean, that's, that's the way we look at it in our fast-paced, disposable culture here in America. And I think that... There are so many people now looking at those things and talking about those things. And they, by, they, by the way, eat very small amounts of meat. And when they do, even when they fry their pork, classically, the style of doing it is that it's then rinsed. A lot of the harmful fats uh, come out. A lot of the healthy fats stay in when pork is twice cooked like that. Um, so it's an amazing thing to see and be a part of. I think being vocal is still important, despite that issue. I mean, you know, and, and look, who's going to sue Oprah? Oprah's going to come back at him with, I mean, she's got, she's like her own country, right? I mean, she's like Switzerland. <laughs> I wouldn't want to mess with Oprah. All right, who else? Charity, I think in the back there. Great beard, by the way. It, a bearded guy is, is next, yeah. then we'll get to the other guy. Bearded guy keeps yeah. pumping his hand up and down. I'm sorry. No, 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 it's all right. <laughs> So uh, you mentioned uh, the subway situation and how long that would take. My question is with certain ingredients that we put in a lot of cheap foods in this country. Uh, can you hear from the microphone? Yeah. Okay. So my question is with a lot of cheap ingredients are things that are made to keep food cheap, like hydrogenated oils, palm oils. What do you feel is a solution for this? Because it's so widespread and it's to inform people about it, it almost feels like it's just an immediate pushback because it's in so much. What do you feel could be a solution to that? Well, I've got some really good news for you. Some of the largest food companies in the world have chosen not to go the way of Kodak and go out of business. So I can speak for one in Minnesota that I'm very, very proud of, and it's one that is universally vilified as being one of the worst examples of big food, and that's General Mills. General Mills had a mission statement uh, for the last 50 years that really had nothing to do with making food. They had become a brand company. And a lot of their brands used a lot of those ingredients and stuff like that. New leadership team came in, and they chose a new mission statement. It was announced, but unlike those splashy announcements of Campbell's and the other people, this one kind of went under the radar. 
Um, and they announced they had a new mission statement, and it was based off a World War II letter from the then head of the company to the board, the owner of the company, to the board. Uh, I think it was James Ford Bell the second. And he wrote the company uh, to the board what a wonderful thing it was to be a part of a group that took food and shared it with love with the world. And this was at a point in time where the world had really come together, right? And food was needed, and shelf stable was needed, and big food was kind of needed to feed people. And there was a great sense of pride there. And General Mills, and I'm going to botch it, but essentially their new mission statement is to be of service of be of service to the world with food through love, or something like that. But service, food, and love are in their mission statement. Food was not in their, the, the, the phrase food was not in their last mission statement. And they are on a quest, you know, to, they're, they're reformulating and remaking lots of their food. And the reason is that in the past, they used to buy companies like uh, uh, Annie's that made the, uh, natural uh, mac and cheese, right? That where it's actually freeze dried cheese, and there are no hydrogenated oils. You know, it's all natural product that mimics the craft mac and cheese, right? So it's and instead of being sixty nine cents, it's a dollar twenty nine, but it's still really inexpensive, and it allows families that want to eat healthily and give their kids mac and cheese, right? They can do it, right? That's your choice if you want to eat mac and cheese. But at least we have a healthy one that doesn't isn't filled with a lot of crap. So General Mills and Kraft and Nestle and all these other big food companies buy companies like that. Well, now they're realizing they can't buy them fast enough and stay afloat, so they better start incubating companies like that with innovation teams, because they have all the R&D and all the money in the world, so they can do it easier than you and I could going out to Silicon Valley and trying to raise $10 million and take five years just to get it in the supermarket, right? So not only are they not only are they putting their work of their innovations in R&D labs, and General Mills is not the only one. All the big food companies are doing it that I'm aware of. And they are committing to remake, you know, I mean, Kraft. And all these giant food companies have been coming out one after another because they're afraid all of you are going to stop buying their product. Because enough people like me and Michael Pollan are saying less meat, cook more, right? Our, our problem, the reason why eating well in America is a class issue, is that it, sometimes we're not just cash poor, we're also time poor. When are we going to do it? So it helps to have products that allow us to put ingredients together in 20 minutes and get it on the table, or something that can go from the freezer to the oven to the table in a short amount of time and serve a family on the go. So the good news is, is that companies are doing it, we're finding out that those ingredients aren't healthy for us, and the new generation of consumers, because of their love of transparency, is not buying them. So the products are changing. I, I know like Progresso Soups at General Mills in August is coming out. They're going to be in Tetra Packs. It's an all-natural product cooked by real people. I mean, it's a massive campaign to start soup season. Um, and I hear about these things because I live in Minnesota, and I have friends at General Mills. That's a huge, huge thing. And as those companies begin to do that, it's going to catch fire. It, it really, which is why I'm bullish on it, because those things are not good for us. Are we going to let this guy yeah, be the last just question? Yeah, being time poor. That's a oh problem my god! As well. So it's two o'clock. I mean, anyone who wants to roll out can do that. We'll take one more question and then we'll Sounds wrap great. up. Sounds great. Hi. Um, so I worked in the inner city education system here in New York City, um, and I was really glad to hear you mention national food programs lunch programs. Um, but the thing that I noticed and was really surprising was that a lot of kids, because there's a stigma around free lunch, won't eat it. Like they'll throw it away. I, I, I think the statistics were like 50% of it gets thrown away. How do we reach into places like the inner city and start to educate people and shift the culture and stigma around you know, government issued food? So it's such a fantastic question. Um, and one that I love to talk about. Um, I have a lot of personal experience with this because as a, as a recovering addict and alcoholic, the last year of my using life, which was 25 years ago, was on the streets of New York as a homeless person. I took meals at the Salvation Army and soup kitchens and stuff like that where I, whenever I needed to eat or needed a bed. And uh, God bless you. And the, the shame of 
uh, hunger insecurity and the, the stigmas around it are just like those with addiction and uh, other recovery issues. People are afraid to come out and say it. One of the ones we're dealing with right now is you know, mental health issues. Who wants to come out and say, I'm bipolar? Will I lose my job? Will my girlfriend want to leave me? Will my friends talk to me? I mean, you know, I have mental health issues. I'm a recovering addict and alcoholic. I shine up pretty good when I'm taking my medicine and I'm not drinking and drugging. You know, I'm a pretty efficient human being. For me, it came down to education. And I think one of the tent poles of our new national food policy has to be education. I will tell you right now, and, and, and this is why I think we're in the midst of this 30-year thing. 20 years ago, I believed in the mythology that exists today that if you went into a school in the inner city in an outer borough, uh, which is, which is code, code for poor people of color, I mean, it's just awful, uh, but if you went out to a school like that, you said, where does milk come from? I do, I do believe 20 years ago, a lot of them would have answered the supermarket. I do believe that the education that we have today, most of those kids now say cows. Because we, it, it became such a national joke. Our kids don't know where milk comes from. So I think that the education, especially in schools, is growing. I believe that your snapshot, snapshot of it is extremely accurate. Um, the shame associated with asking for help is awful. It's awful. I've been there, you know. But we all know we would tell if we were all. I mean, I'm a parent. I tell my kid all the time, asking for help is a sign of strength. It's not a sign of weakness, you know. And I tell them all the time, you're going to take steps you don't believe in to get results you can't imagine. And they sound like those those little sayings sound like greeting cards, but they really do work. And I think it's why we need to have a national food program that's federally funded. And we need to make it a cabinet position because we need to divert education about food to the people that need it the most, parents and kids. It needs to be taught as, a, as one of our major courses. I mean, why are we not teaching food when, we should be t when we've been doing social studies and history and math? I, I mean, look, it's Google, right? But take away my quadratic equation, go for it, dude. Take away my rice or bread, there's revolution in the streets. Right? I mean, we need to be studying food and talking about it and devoting educational resources to it. But I do believe it's getting better. And I would bet that touch was is because we have to let people go back to work. It is. I'm sorry. It was a good, good moment to end on. Everyone, let's say thank you to Chef Andrew. Thank you.